Suppose we're playing an exciting game like Angry Birds, only we don't want to have any copyright violations, so we're going to play Agitated Frogs. We're going to launch these bad boys up in the air, and <coughs> they're going to land on one of these squares, and we're going to see how often they land on each square. So if we had a bird's eye view, oops, not angry birds, frogs. If we had a frog's eye view of where they'd land, because we don't want to use bird's eye. In fact, they make vegetables. And if the frog goes too high, man, it could become a vegetable, in which case this game had quite an impact on its life. But anyway, so we're going to see how often the frogs land in these, in these uh, uh, four different quadrants right here. Well, if we were to predict that they would land in each square an equally uh, likely amount of times, then if we were to launch 40 frogs, we would expect to have 10 landings of those 40 uh, times, 10 landings in each square. We're gonna call these the expected counts in the cell. But what if we actually take a sample of 40 and we keep track of how often they end up in each cell? Maybe in this cell it ended up eight times, nine times here, 13 times here and 10 times here, we want to know is that typical just due to random chance? Like when you flip a coin 20 times, you should expect 10 tails, but you don't always get 10 tails. You might get 8 or 9 or 11. So what we want to know is, is it pretty likely just due to random chance that even though over the long run the frog, frogs will end up in each cell an equal amount of times, is it likely that we could get these kind of discrepancies just due to random chance? Well, that's where a chi-squared test comes into play. We'll have this chi-squared statistic right here. What we're going to do is go into each cell and we'll take the count that we observed. So these are the observed counts. In each cell we're going to say, okay, how far was 8 away from what we would expect? If it was an even distribution in each cell, we would have expected 10 times to land in the cell. We got 8. We're going to square this because some differences are going to be positive, some are neg negative, just like the standard deviation formula we have. And then we're going to divide by the expected count in each cell. And this says summation, we're going to add every cell, we're going to do that for each one. So we observe 9 minus the expected of 10 squared to get rid of negatives and divide by 10. So what it takes to get a big chi-squared test statistic is a big difference between the observed and the expected counts. With small differences, we're going to get a small chi-squared value. In fact, if we ran this test, and we'll be looking at the test later, we would end up with a chi-squared statistic that's very small. It would only be 0.351, and the p-value would be 0.554. In other words, the conclusion is, based on the results we got, there's no reason to believe that the distribution is anything other than an even distribution in each cell. Now, what we can do is we can go to these chi-squared tables and look at degrees of freedom, which we'll talk about in a minute, and we can say, okay, if 5% uh, of the time, just due to chance, how big could the chi-squared statistic get, even if we knew that over the long run the frog was supposed to end up in each cell an even amount of times? Well, what happens is we get these chi-squared distributions, which are skewed to the right. Uh, the only way you can get a zero in a chi-squared test is if there's no difference between the observed and expected. It would be if every time we got like 10 out of 10, so 10 minus 10 is zero, 10 minus 10 is zero. And since we're squaring things, even if we get a negative difference, we can never get a negative chi-squared amount. So in these chi-squared distributions, zero is the smallest number you can get. If you go to the table, you'll find, oh, if you get a critical chi-squared value of uh, 3.84, uh, that means that only 5% of the time, due to chance, when there really isn't a difference in the distribution, 5% of the time, just due to random chance, you'll get a value bigger than 3.84. Clearly, that's a 3. Well, what happens if instead we do this uh, frog launching thing, and we're supposed to get 10 in each cell, but what if instead when we uh, launch these bad boys, they ended up here 5 times, here 13 times, here 15 times, and here 7 times. Well, now we can see is, wait a minute, these observed counts in the blue tend to be pretty far off from what we would have expected. So we're going to suspect that uh, these differences are no longer due to chance. But once again, we can do this. We can say, well, let's go into each cell. In the first cell, we observed, we bad idea to use that color, we observed 5 as our observed count minus what we expected with 10 squared to get rid of negatives and divided by 10. And we do that for every cell, and we add these up, and that's our chi-squared test statistic. In this case, we would get a test statistic of 
And if you recall, when we went to our chi-squared distribution, anything past the chi-squared value of 3.84, remember, anything beyond 3.84, that only happens 5% of the time due to random chance. We got a test statistic way over here at 6.46, so we got a result way over yonder. That is not behaving like there's no difference between the cells. That's behaving like there is a difference. And then we can use our calculators to actually find p-values. Turns out the p-value is real small, so yeah, the evidence suggests, based on our sample result, that the observed counts are so far away from the expected counts, we don't attribute it as being due to random chance, we think there's a significant difference between what we observed and what we expected. So that's really the workings behind the chi-squared. Now, what if you had more cells? Oh, that'd be exciting. We'd launch a bunch of frogs. They could be in any one of these cells. Well, what happens if you think about it, since every cell, we're gonna take observed minus expected squared divided by expected and add them up. Now we have more cells, so naturally, chi-squared is gonna get even larger. And we're going to have to find degrees of freedom like we did in the uh, t-test. And so the formula is the number of rows. Well, we have two rows, so we take 2 minus 1 is 1 times the number of columns minus 1. Well, we have four columns minus 1 is 3. We now have three degrees of freedom. So again, the smallest chi-squared you can get is 0. The distribution is going to be skewed to the right because all the results are squared. But now the chi-squared gets stretched out more because you have eight cells contributing to a chi-squared value. So now we'd like to know, well, again, if there's really no difference between the cells, how big can the chi-squared statistic get just due to random chance? What would our critical chi-squared be in a chi-squared distribution with three degrees of freedom that would happen and only be exceeded 5% of the time? Well, I'm glad you asked. We can go back to this table and we say, oh, with three degrees of freedom, it's 7.81. So this other distribution with one degree of freedom, the chi-squared is only spread out about like this. But with three degrees of freedom, because there's more cells up here, the chi-squared distribution and the chi-squared statistic tends to be bigger. So we need to exceed a value of 7.81 in order to reject the null and believe the differences are not due to chance. They're due to the fact that, uh-uh, it's not an equal distribution or whatever. Now, if we recall, when we do a hypothesis test on proportions, we go to a normal distribution. We put the 0.35 here, and we could know that if we ran this test at an alpha level of 0.05, the critical z-score where the critical region would begin would be at 1.645. And we could use our p-hat right here, and we say, hey, how unusual is this? Is, are we getting a p-hat that's behaving like the kind of results we'd expect? If the true success rate or proportion was 0.35? Well, not in this case. In our case, p hat was just a little bit past 1.645 standard deviations, so we reject the null. It's not behaving like the null is true. There's a statistically significant difference between our statistic and our parameter right here, and so we'd reject the null. Well, the same thing happens in chi-squared. But now we're using these chi-squared distributions, but again, we go to the table, and we find the critical chi-squared scores that trap 5%, just like the critical z-scores that trap 5%, or whatever significance level we're using. And it's as simple as if our chi-squared statistic goes beyond this guy, like the 7.81 in the last test, then we would reject the null in favor of the alternative. So the last thing we need to know are the chi-squared tests that we're going to be studying. There's three of them. If you're only testing one distribution, you're trying to see if that distribution is uniform or bell-shaped or has a ratio of 3 to 2 to 5 to 2 to 2 or something weird like that. The null would be the distribution is as expected, whatever anybody claimed. The alternative is the distribution is not as expected. Now, if we have multiple distributions, one of the tests we can run is a chi-squared test of proportions, or the homogeneity of proportions, where the null would assume all the proportions are equal. The alternative would be that at least one of the proportions is different. So we can have five populations, one, two, three, four, five, that's a two. And then we could have success rates or failure rates, and we just test as uh, many proportions as we want simultaneously. It's like a two-proportion z-test, only now we can test even more uh, proportions at once. And then probably the most common of all chi-squared tests is the test of independence of two variables where at least one of them is categorical. And it might be like this. We want to see two variables, uh, uh, professor and whether 
they are full-time or part-time, and then their level of education. Do they have a PhD? Do they have a master's degree? Or are they imposters, which explains a lot. Anyway, so we'd want to see if there's a difference between like the distribution of education with regard to full-time professors as it is compared to part-time professors. And so that would be a test of independence, kind of squared test of independence of two variables, uh, employment and the uh, education they have. So that's just an introduction to chi-squared. Good luck. I hope you'll look at the other videos as well.